Sh shall we give it a start? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, hello. Um, we are Jan and Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and and we're going to talk about finding user needs. Um, we both work together as uh, UX designers and UX researchers at Wikimedia Deutschland on two products, which is Wikidata. And Wikidata is a semantic knowledge database um, saving stuff like the things you see right-hand side in this info boxes on Wikipedia, like how many people live in Berlin and so on, um, and much more awesome stuff, which you can do with that. Um, and also German Wikipedia, where we um, mainly improve functions catered to um, heavy users like authors, administrators, and so on. Um, yeah, as we saw in the panel discussion, um, user needs was seemingly rated very, as very important, and uh, luckily that's the topic of our talk. And um, let's right dive into it. Um, so the first big question in that regard is, why do we need to know user needs? I mean, it sounds like, like pretty good, but um, when, when does that come like to, to be important? And naturally, I would say it's always important, but I think in, in two cases, it, it, it's sort of um, most obvious in the, in the uh, course of a product, which is like when you, when you want to enter into a new field, which is sort of the ideal thing, you would first do the research and then create a product. But naturally, like in the most cases, there is already a product idea. Um, and then with that idea, you, um, or slightly after, you start the research and then guide the course of the, the of the product and its features um, and add new ideas fed by the user research. And by that, it also helps the creativity in, in finding what the product should do. And an obvious question now would be like, why don't you ask just what users want? But that's a, like a very tricky thing. Um, here like uh, old and overused quote on that. Um, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said us to horses, uh, attributed to Henry Ford, who never said that. Um, but it um, neatly demonstrates that like, just asking, okay, like, what shall we build, please tell us, may not be the ideal way. And if you want to like, tackle it on a more abstract, less figurative level, um, knowing wishes of people and what they imagine to be good for them is not the same as understanding. And having an understanding of your users, of their activities, motivations, problems, is very important to build a motivated, uh, to build a coherent product that is not just a collection of features, but a thing that fits together. Um, so we want to understand the how and why of the user's work. And that is, that is a very important point. And during the course of the talk, it will be about like how can we do that and how can we we do that together with the team. Um, as I said, we want to we want to um, know about the the meaning of things, about actions of users, and b go beyond single issues, and and make them fit together to a to a product that helps the user. And naturally, you don't know like when you start with the research about the house and why's yet. So it is a very important principle in user research to allow for discovery. What does that mean? It means that you want to discover new things you don't expect yet to be the case. One important principle that we often use in our research m methods is asking open questions. So typically what often pops up, yeah, let's do a survey, let's just ask single questions, but those are often cl so uh, so-called closed questions that allow only a, s a small range of answers like do you do this or that or would you like that and then you get like a single single word answer like no but what we actually want to um, get to know new things that we don't know about yet and be surprised we strive to ask open questions in a sort of um, conversation and um, observing the user style that would be like please describe how you started your work today and that demands a story-like answer in which you get potentially many new informations and the users can talk like paragraphs over paragraphs if transcribed about how they started their day. So how does that look in an, in an actual proje uh, project if we do that? Well, to get to know about users, um, you need 
first the data, like, for example, what people answer to these questions. And there are several ways to do that, and we show you um, some uh, methods and examples of it. And usually we kick off our user research with preparing uh, and collecting the knowledge that already is in the team. It's anyway impossible to, to start with a totally blank slate, so it is good to collect some knowledge and assumptions of the team first. And what we do in that case, um, for example, is creating a mind map together with our colleagues, together with some expert users, for example. Um, and for example, here on the right-hand side, we collected um, uh, a still incomplete but huge map of things you can do in our image database, Wikimedia Commons, um, like uploading images, commenting on images, and so on. And we try to see in which problem space we are moving in researching the needs of Commons users. And based on that, we can create a guide on where we have information needs, where we want to know more about the workflows, and so on. And when you collect the information you already have that was in the heads of your developers, of like expert users you may have access to, um, you would create a research guide where you write that down, what you want to ask, and you would then go, as it's called, in the field to your users and gather that data. And the typical method would, uh, which, which we apply most is like talking to users and observing them, having demonstrations of their work, but before we can do that, naturally, we would need to find the users. Currently, we do mostly research with, um, with expert users that are part of our communities. Um, so um, we recruited a lot via mailing lists, asked if people would be interested, and also made transparent the wh what we hope users can gain from that research. Um, but there are like several other methods you can get participants in that research. And um, then we hopefully gather interesting insights and data. And uh, Charlie will introduce you to some examples where we did that in projects. All righty. Um, so one thing we try to do is to meet the users in real life and not remote, which is not always possible. And you obviously don't always want that as well if your community is maybe very international. But if you talk to them in person, then um, you can see finer nuances in their responses. And uh, I did this for uh, one of my research projects where I, uh, we have in our office, we have a bi-weekly community meetup of the German Wikipedia community, um, editors mostly, uh, only actually. Um, so I go there regularly and talk to them, even if I don't have specific questions, just to find out what, what the current problem is, because they chat about, oh, this went wrong and blah, blah, blah. And But if I, have specific questions, I can always ask them about it and even conduct a little research. Um, and yeah, like I said, if uh, if you use it, oh no, right, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, the, another thing that we once tried is um, to gather insights uh, on a topic with a specific scope was uh, to do this in an open online format. So since Wikipedia is a wiki, uh, people are comfortable with the format of a wiki and uh, we, after we conducted a research, uh, we posted our scenarios that we came up with there and asked the community to comment on those scenarios and contribute to them. So kind of as a feedback loop to see um, if they can identify with them and uh, if they represent the, the issue at hand well. Um, yes, so and then what Jan already mentioned, uh, remote research is very useful if you have a large international community that Wikimedia Commons does, for example, which is this media repository where you can upload all your Creative Commons uh, media files uh, to share with the world. Um, and uh, there we usually do like a Google Hangout or Skype, depending or whatever the user is most comfortable with. That's usually the easiest way to go. And also, the thing is, this can be restrictive, though, since um, the, the user needs to be comfortable enough with a computer and with um, this video chatting. Uh, so this already uh, kind of uh, restricts your user group that is that you can talk to. Um, but yeah, but we do ask them to share their screen if they're willing and uh, guide us through a workflow. And we try to ask those open questions that Jan mentioned before. and 
find out their motivations and how they work. Uh, it's your turn. <laughs> okay, so what you now have after having conducted five to uh, ten interviews would be typical. Um, you have like a lot of data, usually we write that down in, in um, notes we made during the interviews or even transcripts of the audio. And having the data in that form doesn't mean that you can use it well because it's basically like a long, long text structured by um, sort of the time, the linear timeline you, you went through there. Um, and to have it in a better accessible form for use by designers, by management, you need to make sense of that data and structure it in an accessible way. This is partly based on interpretation. So it is empirical since it uses like that gained data, but it's also subjective because there are different ways to interpret something a user set. And I often compare that to building a Lego house. So like you would have like some material you start with and uh, then you put it into a coherent form. There's also a bit of creativity in that and there are also like many different ways, for example, to build a house but it's like not an arbitrary process. Just taking that, that bunch of Lego bricks and throwing it somewhere else doesn't make it a house, doesn't make it a coherent structure. Um, and also there are like certain rules on that kind of interpretation and so on. Um, question is like a nice abstract metaphor and nice Lego bricks, how does that look like when we do that? And Typically, and also like the form we now show, show since it's like most visually, it's um, clustering um, nodes on a big wall. Um, so like on uh, every of these um, sticky notes there would be like one assertion a user made, um, like a little clipping, um, and you end up with like, I don't know, 100, 200 nodes of these um, often, and then you start to put them up and um, you put up more and more and like then you you see some share similarities um, and you already like maybe have some some uh, headlines for them and then over the time you also improve the headlines usually you start with some labels like um, maybe images or upload or something like that and later on you may come up with a more um, with a title that's more closer to a design principle or to a problem, like uploading images is difficult, or um, if I edit, I do edit a bunch of images instead of one or something like that. And so, like over the course of the of the research, you would like make the clusters more clear, uh, redo them, redo them again, and so on, like you would do if you built with Lego. Um, and then at the end, maybe like find out some sort of general themes that you hold as very important. <laughs> And that's what that looks like then in sort of on the, as a photo on the, on the wall. So um, that will result in a, in a list of themes, like general principles, um, stuff that repeats for the user in a, in a way that has like an important meaning for, for you or them. Um, but like still it isn't, like it's a form that's very well accessible for you as a researcher, but maybe not for management or programmers and so on. So you will bring that into different formats that you can use well in design. Um, and some of these formats and examples for them will be introduced by Charlie now. Is this a switch? Okay. Um, right, so you've got your structured data now and you want to communicate it to um, to your colleagues or um, uh, colleagues or uh, community members, and um, one thing you can do is you can use personas. Um, so those are um, profiles of functional us users, and uh, they have a role, they have a name, they have specific problems, they're in a specific place in their life, they have specific activities, and this helps um, when developing to um, to relate the things you're doing to someone. So you're not doing it for some generic person, but you try to envision like I'm programming this for Melissa because she needs this exact function. And um, yeah, so this is usually a very helpful tool. Um, and we want to find out um, how exactly Melissa works or any of the personas. Um, and uh, one tool we use is story mapping. Uh, so this is a workflow visualization um, 
where uh, every specific step um, is, sorry, <laughs> um, yes, uh, is, is lined out. And for every specific step, you can have um, very, um, very specific nodes, which are the pink posters you see, um, as well as motivations. And uh, also putting it out like this can help uh, the developers and anyone come and comment and get a better feel for um, the, yeah, the, the workflow. Um, the other thing that's really helpful is paper prototyping. So um, uh, this is really, you can do this really well with uh, people that are also not very experienced because, um, because uh, it's very interactive. You can change things really easily. You don't get too attached to the, the actual mock-up that you're making. And you can even click through it, like uh, replace papers and, and yeah, envision how it could look later. So there are, there are some challenges we, where we still want to improve our research. Um, and I will give you a very brief introduction on what, what would be future topics for the next year. Um, one of them is increasing contribution culture. So as we like, talked about a lot already, like uh, open source um, software development is often very focused with all its tools and workflows on coding. And we would like to um, have the possibilities that you as a developer can do, like submit a patch, something like that, also um, for our community and to design with them instead of just for them. Um, yeah. um, also, um, we, we um, try to, to go into the, the realm of like finding different design tools. That, for example, is uh, Dryo, which is basically like an other pad for diagramming and wireframing that um, we want to use more in the future because there you can easily collaborate with other internet users. And I just want to add to that that uh, we did that because um, putting everything out in open source as or like as a, on a Creative Commons license, you've been using open source tools is helpful, but that's always like post process that like the community can then after the fact, uh, edit and use it, but we are trying to more collaboratively work with them. So what we also do is maybe do <laughs> workshops with them where we not teach them stuff, but uh, we develop prototypes with the community actively. Um, another thing is right now we're having, uh, like when we recruit users, uh, we do this individually. So we ask every single one of them if they would like to help us, uh, which works maybe if we don't need so many for a big qualitative analy uh, quantitative analysis, but, um, Sorry, qualitative. There we go. Um, <laughs> but if we need doing shorter uh, usability tests, we need more people, and we don't have a participant pool right now. And we're trying to build this, but there are many legal issues, and um, and so we we're actually talking with a lawyer right now um, to set up a f paperwork that is uh, like legally sound. And uh, when we're done, we're hoping to publish it, so anyone with an open source project can use this to then have a you know, sound base for a participant pool because of like data security issues, you know, you know the thing. Um, another thing is we want our stuff to work for everyone. And right now, uh, getting, uh, like finding users is only easy with expert users because those are the ones already on mailing lists and IRC and on Wiki. But how do we get the ones that are like passive, like readers of Wikipedia? It's hard to get to them. So um, a thing we can do is, uh, what the English Wikipedia did is have banners for non-logged in users. But uh, we're also thinking about just contacting people on Facebook or Twitter, so where people that like the product but maybe don't contribute uh, can see it. Um, was that it? Yeah. Um, here are some useful links if you're interested in more uh, research methods. And those are all under Creative Commons as well. And right, uh, so that's our email and Twitter handle. and. You can find more open source design things on opensourcedesign.net and please give us feedback. And also we're hiring, <laughs> so check that link. Um, and yeah, if you want to talk to us, uh, we're here and uh, Vicky Data Product Manager is here as well, as well as um, Community man man Manager. <laughs> uh, that's it, sorry, the last we had to rush the last minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Do we talk too fast? <laughs> I could try.
quite an open question on the mailing list, um, just to ask and collect uh, information from one. We've done people. this on Wiki, so we um, we have this thing called Project Chat, and so we opened an issue, not an issue, like a thing, and just uh, asked, what do you think about this issue? What are your problems? Have you generally... <sighs> Yeah, well, what do you want us? Because we were, we knew we were going to work on it, but we didn't exactly know where to start. And this was actually quite helpful. So it was a very open question, and you can get a lot of stuff that maybe is not useful. But um, it was a really good start, like pre-research thing to gather some first information. Yeah, usually it helps to provide some structure with it, like the scenarios we gave to um, give people some form how they can answer that. But there we already had like. Scenarios already was after the research, but we do have like um, questions that they can then answer, not just like tell us anything. Me, it, it's it's helpful. I would be always afraid of the huge amount of people that could answer those questions. Yes, go through the answers. But we want a huge amount of. People. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there. Oh, oh, sorry. You want to say yeah, something else? I don't know. It's like no, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, because uh, it's like if they share their screen, for example, that's something, and uh, we do anonymize them. So when we talk to them, we don't we we don't use their name or something, or maybe even not even their username, because you know. Uh, and what are, what other issues are there? Yeah, but uh, I don't know. why is it still a legal issue if you do that already? Hmm? Because we need it to be uh, legally sound. Like they need to. Right now we're just doing it kind. We're just kind of uh, talking to them. But uh, when we have like yeah. a participant pool, we need them to sign that it's okay that we talk yeah. to them and that we can use the data in an aggregated way and so yeah. forth. It's just that people need to consent if you yeah. use their data. Right now we're doing it like a, a per each person as a person. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. Do you share with other countries on Wikimedia, or is it only for yourself? Uh, um, well, that maybe other Wikimedia countries are doing the same. Wikidata, Wikidata is developed mainly in Germany, and that's where our research goes. If we um, do research that concerns Wikipedia, um, we share that with our colleagues and are in close contact with them to discuss that research and our methods. Uh, they are very likely not doing that because they have no software staff and then certainly nobody who does specific user research on software. The most sharing occurs with uh, the Wikimedia Foundation, who they are like the biggest chapter, and um, they we we try we are in an open discussion with them all the time, so we do share a lot. So the, we, the foundation knows. But yes, of course. Yeah. Well, time's up. Yep. Thank you so much. You can always catch them if you have any questions for them. Okay.